Welcome to WordStream Live with Pastor Howard Carpenter. Welcome to WordStream Live. I'm your online minister, Scott Grimm. Glad to have you here with us today. We're so excited today at WordStream Live uh, to begin our our expositional study uh, by uh, someone that I dearly love, Pastor Howard Carpenter. I'm going to go ahead and bring Pastor Howard on now. Uh, Howard, uh, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you here today. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, listen, uh, Howard's a very humble man. And, uh, you know, one thing about opinions, you know, some sometimes they're, they're good and bad. They're like armpits. Sometimes they stink, but sometimes they smell pretty good. Let me tell you, the Bible's real clear. It says uh, to let another man praise you and not the words of your own mouth. And uh, I want to I want to praise uh, one thing about Howard is he's a student of the word. He's a workman that, that doesn't uh, that needs not be ashamed because he really studies to show himself approved, as you're going to find out here today. We're really blessed today to be able to start a study, uh, an expositional study uh, by Pastor Howard. Uh, uh, like I said, and I believe he's one of the better Bible teachers in the country when it comes to expository teaching and preaching. Uh, and you're going to you're going to find out for yourself. But anyway, uh, we're going to start a, a expositional study on the book of Ephesians today uh, at WordStream Live. If you haven't already done so in the description of this video is the really the precursor to Howard's teaching on the book of Ephesians. You want to get it. You get a chance. You want to go in there and, and watch that video. I put a link in the description of the video. Uh, you get a chance. Go in and watch that no matter when you're seeing this. But anyway, uh, welcome to WordStream Live, and uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to Pastor Howard Carpenter uh, and uh, and begin our, our study in the book of Ephesians. So get your Bibles out, get ready, uh, and and we're going to take a moment to pray, and then and then we're going to get right into this study with Pastor Howard. Howard, why don't you go ahead and take us to the Lord. Father, we are grateful, Lord God. We're grateful, Lord God, that you never leave us, that you never forsake us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you gave us your word, O oh God, that we would know what to believe, how to behave, Lord, how to honor you, Father, how to live in a manner worthy of the gospel that we've been given. And Father, we ask, O oh Lord, today that you give us ears to hear, Father, eyes to see, Lord, the richness that is contained in your word. Father, let your word, let your word, O oh God, speak to our souls, and Father, that it would change our hearts and direct our feet. We pray, Father, your will to be done today, that you're honored, that you receive glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, good morning, everyone, by the way. Uh, speaking of humbling, you know, there's that old saying that children are to be seen and not heard. Well, apparently we need to change that because I find out yesterday that I spoke for an hour and the only thing that was moving were my lips. Uh, everyone saw me, but they heard nothing. Of course, some might just think that was that was good. So anyway, last week's introduction to the Ephesus study was about recognizing the critical nature of teaching through sound doctrine, because it is from knowing and understanding doctrine, grasping its importance and the implications of them. Why? Because doctrine forms what should be our beliefs, our worldview, from which flows our duties as Christians and how we are to believe or how we are to, to live, how we are to uh, behave. This was illustrated by speaking to the necessity last time of, the, of sound doctrine as seen in the Ephesus church where the apostle Paul pleads with a reluctant, the timid Timothy to remain in the place of responsibility where Timothy didn't want to be and to recognize the danger of doctrinal drift that was going on in that church that comes from tolerating strange or illegitimate, the word means, doctrine, paying attention to myths, stories, fantasies, which were nothing more than inventions designed to seduce the hearer, all of which does nothing to advance the cause of Christ, advance the kingdom of God, but does expose one to a shipwrecked faith, and sometimes even to that uh, uh, where you're, the dis, doctrine is so diseased that it leads to spiritual gain green, to use Paul's words. For example, Peter warned saints in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. False prophets also arose from among the prop, the uh, from the people. He's referring to the Old Testament. Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, 
even denying the master, the Lord, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many, hear that, many will follow their sensuality. And, beca and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Not truth, but false words. This is why Paul warned the Ephesus church in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, that the time will come when they will not endure. They're not going to put up with sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate. That means heap it up. In other words, you'll have a vast inventory of false teachers. Teachers in a, teaching in accordance with their desires. Not the will of God, but according to their own desires. Whatever the people want, that's what you give them. Not what God said, but give them what they want. And we'll turn their ears away from the truth, and we'll turn aside to myths. And the fifth verse that follows had to bring conviction to Timothy and to any single one of us that's not recognizing, not taking this epidemic seriously, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So this week, I was, kind of, I was trying to think of how best to express the purpose of this study in Ephesus. And I was reminded of back in my early 20s that I, was, I had entered a, a management position. This was obviously a thousand years ago. And I received a letter offering me options on shares of company stock at the, that I would be able to buy at some point in the future at the current price, which was considered low. And then later on, sometime years down the road, I could choose to exercise those options, buy them at the old price and sell them at a new price. Hopefully there would be a skyrocketing price in, in a growing company. Well, the problem was when I received that letter, I didn't understand it and I threw it right into the trash. Years later, I received a letter telling me I had a short period of time left to exercise those options. And thank God, this time I was a little smarter than I was than I had been before and had a greater grasp of what I held in my hand and didn't throw that letter into the trash, but exercised those options. And turning out that in today's dollars, it was actually almost about 200 grand. It's all gone. I wish I'd still had it, but it's all gone. Our goal is similar in that we so grasp the depths of the richness of these doctrines that we hold in our hands that we not toss, that we dare not toss them into the trash, that we appreciate some of those critical biblical themes and, and, and doctrines of Christianity, that we have a strong, that we possess a strong foundation that carries over into our daily lives, despite the circumstances that we face. Charles Spurgeon, arguably one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century, gave the book of Ephesians its due. He says, the epistle is a, a complete body of divinity. In the first chapter, you have the doctrines of the gospel. In the next, you have the experience of, of the Christian. And before the epistle is finished, you have the precepts of the Christian faith. Whosoever would see Christianity in one treatise, he says, let him read, mark, learn and inwardly digest the epistle to the Ephesians. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, we ought not to throw these riches into the trash. We begin with what Paul, an epistle by the will of God, what is in the Greek in verses 3 through 14, which we'll read in a moment, it is one long sentence. There's no punctuation. One long sentence. It's as if Paul is so wrapped up, so enthralled with what he had grasped when the riches contained in these precious doctrines in these first few verses that he couldn't stop to catch his breath. The list from the passage begins using three variations of the same word for blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul writes in the fashion of the psalmist in Psalm 64 verse 9. That all men will fear and they will declare the work of God and will consider what he has done. That's what Paul was doing, considering what God had done. In 66, 16 in the Psalms, come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul. Paul is praising and thanking God for his master plan, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And he, as it says in verse 9 through 10, he says, he made, to, he made known to us the mystery of his will, the church, according to the good pleasure which he set forth in him regarding his plan of the fullness of time. 
to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. See, Paul is caught up with the realization that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places of Christ. He said, he sees in verse seven, the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, the riches of his glory in verse 18, the showing of boundless riches of his grace in two seven. And finally in three fourteen, according to the riches of his glory. So for context, if you read with me the whole 14 verses, even though we're, going, we're only going to call, uh, cover just a few, but just for context purpose, let's take the time to read it. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we'd be, we would be holy and blameless according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption to his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he has set forth in him, regarding his plan of the fullness of times to bring all things together in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth. In him we have also obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will, to the end that we, were, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed with him, with the Holy Spirit of the promise, who is a first installment of our inheritance in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So if the hearer of God's word is not to throw hit these riches into the trash, we must, we must, we must not pass over the significance of the first phrase that followed these spiritual blessings that he just named. Beginning in verse four, just as, just as, to, to appreciate the value of that little word, that little phrase, consider this, to grasp, to, to, to understand it, to appreciate it. He says in Matthew 26, four, saying the son of man is going away just as it is written about him. In Matthew 28, 6, when speaking of, uh, uh, in speaking of the Lord of the tomb where he, where, where he had been buried, saying, he is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. See, it is in the same passion, or the same fashion that, that Paul makes a statement of these spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, while just as is the link to the proof of that statement. What he follows, that proves the point. The empty tomb was the proof just as it was written. The tomb being empty or the Lord leaving for a while shouldn't surprise or bring fear into our lives because it is just as is it as it is written. His word is to believe, to be believed and trusted. And in our passage today, the proclamation that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places is followed by the proof just as. He is saying, come see the proof. Just as he said, just as it is written, believe it. Don't doubt what he says. Take the riches of these eternal doctrines, take them to the bank. And he launches into this long, I can't stop. I can't stop to breathe sentence with, uh, with what I call in this passage, the triple doctrines, these, uh, the, in this, a rich type trifecta described here as you were selected. These are the three doctrines that we're going to see in these over the next uh, three weeks, Lord willing. And the first one being the one we're going to cover today, you were selected by the Father. The second being you were saved by the Son. And the third, you were secured by the Holy Spirit. Three persons in the Godhead, the Trinity, are all involved in these first three, first few verses. And to varying degrees, they've been tossed aside. That God chose us before the foundation of the world has been thrown out by many as unfair, thrown into the trash. Doesn't make sense. It assaults the very character of God. The doctrine of salvation through Christ alone has been tossed and replaced by many who say, yes, Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus, yet it is Jesus alone. 
and, and one that is all too common in the church is the spiritual blessing that states that even if one is secured for eternity, truly converted, regenerated, held in the Father's hand, yet can still, some claim, lose their salvation. Whole denominations subscribe to this. See, there's a reason Paul begins this letter with this trifecta of truth, this tr that we will spend the, the time, the next three times we meet, to examine the overwhelming written evidence just as, just as he said, never drifting, never tossing, the trash. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given me, like a wise builder, I laid a foundation, another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds. This is what was built, and we are to build carefully upon it, beginning today with selected by the fa Father, one from which we ought to lose our breath over, and one from which we ought to, to lead, not to throw these riches into the trash, but, to, to, uh, but an enthusiastic pursuit in our duties as believers, in our almighty God, in the right way to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. We'll see first immediately following the just as in verse 4, he says, just as God chose us in him, this means that this is God's method of choosing, i.e. through election. This is one of those profound and unmistakable fundamentals in the riches of God's method of salvation and the purpose in doing so. Before we look at this, it's helpful to recognize this pattern of selection throughout, throughout the, the thread runs throughout the fabric of this word. He says the pattern of selection throughout scripture is seen in two other distinct ways by which the Lord sovereignly chooses or picks someone from among mankind. In addition to election to salvation, there is also what's called the, uh, theocratic uh, selection where God chooses Israel and vocational selection as one put some, as God puts somebody in office, like he did Paul, like he did the apostles. We see Israel and God's sovereign theocratic selection uh, in this, uh, we see that process of both Deuteronomy chapter seven and, four, and Deuteronomy 14, two, Moses writing of Israel says, the Lord has chosen you, there's a selection. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth he chooses them, adding in 26, 19, that he, will, that he will set you high above all the nations which he has made. Of all those great nations, all those nations, those empires that have risen and fallen, the Lord did not choose. He didn't choose the Assyrians, Babylon, or Egypt, or Rome, but marked Israel to be a distinct and special nation above all others, which was supported, which was supported in Amos's comment in chapter 3, verse 2, you only, he's saying to Israel, you only have I chosen among all the families, all the tribes of the earth. God's election in choosing them had nothing to do with merit. They hadn't done anything good or bad. It's not the basis for that selection. He says in Deuteronomy 7, 7, the Lord did not make you his beloved, nor choose you because you were greater in number than any of the peoples. He chose one. There's also vocational selection, such as we re read in Romans chapter 1, Paul, the bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And which in verses 4 and 5, he adds that the apostleship was re received from Jesus Christ. Paul, in our own text that we just read, Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. We really see the pattern of God's so not sovereign selection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, where those in the church, each one of us who are born again, to each he has given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Adding later in verse 11, Paul says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each individually, just as he wills, as God wills. And in verse 18, but he now placed has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desires. God sovereignly doing this. Of course, we, we, act, we know from the, the passages in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, or 12, 13 and 14, that some people aren't, aren't, don't like that what God desired and what his will was. You know, the eye wants to be the, wants, doesn't, he wants to be the head or the one that's got the foot wants to be the, wants to be the eye. People not satisfied and consequently, subsequently not using the gifts God has given. So, but those are the two methods of, of selection that 
that I just mentioned are not what Paul is talking about here, not referencing here, but it's the pattern that God uses. Because he's referring to God's method of choosing for salvation, just as is written. <clears throat> and it's pretty cotton picking hard not to see the pattern of choosing throughout Scripture. Paul wrote in Colossians 3:12, those who have, <clears throat> excuse me, those who have been chosen of God. He also clearly stated to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Declaring, knowing, declaring this, knowing, brethren, believed by, uh, beloved by God, his choice of you. Paul's epistle in First Timothy, in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, he writes, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. Paul writes, or Peter writes in First Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, uh, an apostle of Christ Jesus, that was his vocation that God chose him to, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout, who are chosen, picked out from all of mankind, according to the foreknowledge of, of, the, of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, speaking to that redemption. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his, according to his great mercy, has caused us. You see God working. God caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, just as we said. Try as one wants, one cannot escape. God sovereignly chooses. Whether it's Jesus telling his disciples in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Or James 2, 5. Listen, my beloved brother, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And the heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him, love, love him. Or Peter in two, in, uh, in two, uh, first Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race. And finally, not that we couldn't keep going, but simply because of time. Before somebody turns me off and you're just watching the lips move. He says, those that wage war against the lamb, this is a future time. Those that wage war against the Lamb will be overcome by the Lamb, the second coming of Christ, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him, he identifies, are called and chosen to be faithful. The reality is that many have rejected this doctrine of election as uh, capricious and unfair. Unfortunately, despite the clear written words given in passage after passage, they can't be they cannot be ignored their approach is to reject what is written and assume it must be something else such as god since god knew the decision we would make that he would that we would make a that he would he could look through time and say you know what uh, i see that howard's going to accept the gospel when he when he hears it he's going to obey the gospel uh therefore i'm going to mark uh howard down now in my form, it, it, I'm going to predestine him now because I know what he's going to do. That's that's not what the scripture says. And it it, fall, it flies in the face of everything that we've read. God does the choosing. He chooses ahead of time. Somebody once said that if man was the author of scripture rather than God, he would explain the method. He would write a 28th book in the New Testament of how God chooses rather than leave it, you know, leave it what someone called vague. This is because man cannot handle not having the answer. And so many come up with their own answer, speculating what God had said, rather than consider what he actually said, or just as he, or just as he said. This is why Paul follows, just as God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. The key here is what? Before the foundation. Before the world was created, before man's sin, before the law, before the before, before the Lord's conception, Jesus' conception, and before the church, all that man would see, the choice was made before anything. God didn't sit around and, and discuss. The Trinity didn't sit down and, and look into the future. I'll pick, or I know he's going to do good, so I'll pick him. It has nothing to do with it. That's not what it says. To, to, to say that God looked into the future and saw you were a pretty good guy, then man gets the credit. And in, in, the, in, the, in the gospel message, man does not get the credit. 
the, the glory goes to God alone. The credit goes to God alone, not man. And as we, when we get to Ephesians 2, we'll really see, and most of you, I trust, know that. We got nothing but dirty rags. That's, that's all we have to boast about, which we can't boast about. But we surely can't boast about what we have done to make ourselves worthy of being saved. The only thing that makes us worthy of being saved is a humble recognition that I am a sinner deserving to, to pay a price for it and to recognize that Jesus paid and trust in him for my salvation. For my eternity, my security, eternity with Christ. Romans 8 makes it clear, also makes it clear that God makes these decisions. For those whom he foreknew and arranged, meaning arranged ahead of time, knew ahead of time, arranged ahead of time, he also predestined, determined ahead of time to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. He arranged it all ahead of time, irrespective of what man, irrespective of man. The ceiling of, of the riches of our elect, election is wrong on so many points. It gives man some credit for his salvation, like a work of prequalification. That speculation fails to consider the enormity of what is written. People are coming up with their own just as. And the presumption fails to see the pattern of the sovereign choice that is in vocation in Israel. It fails to see the truth of God's sovereign cho choosing. When in Romans uh, uh, 9, that Paul, writing of, of Rebekah, conceived twins by one man, uh, uh, our father a I Isaac. For through, for through the twins were not born, for though the twins were not born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. In other words, God made the decision. He made it, made it, it, he made it ahead of time. He chose Jacob, not Esau, not because of anything good or bad, but he chose it. It was his choice. And God didn't tell him, tell us, lay it out there. Why? But that's who he chose. This was his will. This was his plan. It fails to remember, this is key. It fails to remember that we walk by faith. And not by sight. But not, we don't, throughout our, throughout our Christian life, we walk by faith and our trust in our Lord based on what is written, not by what we see. Even when we are perplexed, sometimes fully at the end of ourselves, at wit's end, we continue to walk by faith in what is written. Otherwise, we'll be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It, it is a walk by faith faith by trusting in him should we not should we not walk by faith in his choosing in god's methodology just as it is written do we not trust his decisions to be the best isaiah 55 gives us a glimpse a glimpse of this and a call to turn to god to the wicked to abandon his way and the unrighteous person his thoughts to seek the lord while he may be found to call upon him while he is near, and the Lord will have compassion upon him and will abundantly pardon. Then the Lord follows this call with a phrase indicating that what God does is a mystery, can be a mystery. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your way, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are our my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We are to conform to him as revealed in what is written, not attempt the, the futile, futility in demanding that God conform to our way of thinking. Over 53 years, 53 years 250 years ago, there's a, season, a period of time in history, especially in Europe, what was called the Enlightenment, which was a movement characterized by a belief in the power of reason the pursuit of knowledge, evidence of science, and the skepticism toward um, authority and, and, the, and the church, or in religion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in all, in all too many ways, our thinking and our means of doing have gravitated to think we are sufficiently enlightened to figure it all out without God. We have come to decisions without God, 
and then ask him to bless it anyway. We sometimes forget man by nature is blinded by the God of this world, darkened in his understanding, even and sometimes while even we who are regenerated, who know him, have a relationship with Christ, are still, as Paul described in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mere dimly. In other words, um, it's, it's just not clear. It, it's a riddle. He goes on to say, but then, in other words, when we see Jesus face to face, we're, we won't see. We'll see him clear. It won't be a riddle anymore. Now I know in part. In other words, I only know. I only see part of the picture. But I. But then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. In other words, in the future, when I am face to face with Christ, what is obscure today will not be obscure then. To recognize that I can't see three hundred and sixty degrees today. Spurgeon offers his thoughts on this. And naturally, I would pick him. We couldn't handle this greater, to quote, we couldn't handle this greater knowledge on this side of eternity. If we knew more of our sinfulness, we would be driven to despair. If we knew more of God's glory, we might die of terror. If we had more understanding, unless we had equivalent capacity to employ it, we might be filled with conceit and tormented with ambition. But up there, we shall have our minds and our systems strengthened to receive more without the damage that would come to us here from the overlapping boundaries of order, supremely appointed and divinely regulated. Can't, can't put him on pause. I read a commentary that quoted uh, a gentleman by the name of J.A. Packers and the book was Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, stating that all Christians believe in divine sovereignty, but some are not aware that they do, and mistakenly imagine while insisting on rejecting it, what causes, this, what causes this odd state of affairs? It doesn't make any sense. He said the root cause is the same as in most cases of error in the church. The intruding of rationalistic, the intruding of rationalistic uh, speculations, the passions for systematic consistency, the reluctance to recognize the existence of mystery and to let God be wiser than men, which of course leads to subject, subjecting scripture to the supposed demands of human logic and the unwillingness to let God be wiser than man. People see that the Bible teaches man's responsibility for his actions, but they do not see man, and indeed man can't see how this is consistent with the sovereign lordship of God over these actions. They are not content to let these true, two truths live side by side, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility to respond as they do in scripture, but jump to the conclusion that in order to uphold the biblical truth of human responsibility, they are bound to reject the equally biblical and equally true doctrine of divine sovereignty and to explain, to explain the great number of texts that teach it. The desire to oversimplify the Bible by cutting out the mysteries is natural to our perverse minds. And it is not surprising that even godly men sometimes fall victim to it. He closes with, hence this persistent and troublesome dispute. The irony of the situation is that we that when we ask how the two sides pray, we all pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we pray, why do we why do we go to a sovereign God? Because he's one with he's the one that holds it all together. He's the one that looks down. He, he knows what's best. He's the one that gives a yes or a no, or maybe later, or no, never. He's the one that does it. So obviously recognizing right there the sovereignty of God in choosing what he answers. God's choosing his way. Never to be you, our way. Romans 6.16 says our responsibility is to obey the gospel. To be saved is to obey the gospel. Paul says in Romans 6.16, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Hebrews 5 tells us that Jesus became uh, came to all who, who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. Ten, Romans 10.15 says that not all have believed or obeyed the gospel. 
And in this scenario, in this scenario is despite the 13th verse proclaiming who will ever call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there's human responsibility. There has to be a response briefly to obey the gospel and receive eternal salvation is, as Paul writes in, uh, uh, in Romans 10, verses 9 through 12, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as the Lord, that's, that's an unreserved victory that confesses from your mouth that he is Lord, that he is master, that he is sovereign, submitting to him, agreeing with him that I'm a sinner, agreeing and repenting of that sin and turning to the Lord as my Lord, as my king. I'm no longer on the throne. I'm no longer on that throne. Just as he told me. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I believe that Jesus died and paid for paid the price for my sin, a just penalty, one who offends a holy God, and that he is no longer in that grave, just as it is written. And for with a heart, a man for with a for with the heart, a man believes, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, positioning right before God. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's that sincere and deeply held belief. Not just here, from the heart that cannot help but say with the mouth, now puts their equally unreserved trust in him, evidencing this humility of one who is poor in spirit, broken in spirit, that he might see the kingdom of God. And you will be declared righteous, holy, and blameless. But the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction, he goes on to say, between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Man may look upon the, appearance, the, appearance, the outward appearance of man, the color of his skin or of his place in society, and my money he's got in the bank. All these kind of things, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Obey the gospel just as it, as it is written. You will not walk away disappointed. And as one who has called on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Then you will know you are chosen. When you are truly born again, regenerated, resulting in righteousness, you will know. You will know. Then you know. Then the question's had. Then, it, then it's no longer vague. It's clear. I think I'm going to move a little quicker here. I was at the dentist uh, this past Monday. And as always seemed to be the case, when I was leaving the scheduler's desk after the uh, 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 the treatment, I couldn't find the door. <laughs> and the reason being is because it's not designed right. It's not it's not designed as logic says it should be. I mean, I expect every 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 uh, aisle and door in that place is designed just like a Pennsylvania road. They're not 90 degrees. They're all over the place. You, and you never, sometimes you're taken off this way and you end up, you go all this place, you end up at the same place. You see the same road, same cars going by in front of you, same road going by in front of you. And it, it, here I'm looking, I can't, you can't figure out where, I don't know where to go. You turn around from the desk and I go, and I end up going through the wrong door. And I even said it was a, walking out last week. You know, I always get lost here going to the wrong cotton picking door. Her response? She says, we do the same. And too many of us do the same thing, following our own logic. And of course, our better way of doing things, leaning on our own understanding rather than just trust him in his design for, uh, for uh, salvation and for direction. Trust in his character, his love, mercy, grace, holiness, justice, desire that man not perish. It was a mystery to my finite mind that the dentist office was to me of an illogical design. But since, as Paul told the told those Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, the, fool, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. We need to stop doing the wrong thing. The same thing. You know, sometimes I think we're persuaded by what is called a straw man. This is a phrase describing somebody. This is in politics, politics and business all the time. And this is a phrase where someone is generating uh, discussion about the disadvantages of existing practices, policies, procedures, uh, mission statement, vision, and all those kind of things, all of the intention to provoke generation, a generation of, the generation of, 
new and better ideas and proposals. There's been too far, been far too long an argumentative and contentious spirit created by straw men who challenged the perceived disadvantages of what is written and present some new thoughts and ways that are more logical, in our opinion, or designed rightly, in our opinion, as one thinks they ought to be. And rather, we ought humbly to consider the reality that we really do see dimly, that the potter's ways and thoughts are really above our own. And that what seems to be an illogical design is because we see in part only and not forget the character of God who is merciful and desires that none perish. God knows what he's doing. Perhaps some need to put aside the straw man. Some need to cease being the straw man. Cease challenging God's sovereign design plan and generating one's own. Let God be God. Return to doing what is written and obey the command to spread the gospel to all men, to all world, to the entire world, and make disciples of, of all. The, the chosen are probably all around. Give them the gospel, just as written, just as he told us. Let's put away the straw man. And I find it difficult to grasp how one cannot be overwhelmed with the thought that God chose us from the foundation of the world. Why he didn't start over. Well, he did start over for us. I still can't fathom. I am so grateful that he's chosen. I know that I'm chosen. I know. I know. I know. By And, and we, we know here because we see the purpose in what God did. We see the results of what God did. When he draws us to himself in that irresistible magnet of John 6, 44, Jesus, no man cometh unto me unless he who sent me draws him. So it, God grants the repentance. God is involved. God desires that none perish. All we have to do is obey the gospel. And this is the, and this, and now he tells us the purpose in him, in this methodology, what the outcome of this, what these are. He, he says, number one, and these are, these are in those few verses, four, uh, four through six. He said, God gives us a new life, one where we would be holy and blameless before him. We have changed positionally from being dead in our sins, darkened in understanding, carrying out all, carrying out all the desires of the flesh, to now being positionally before God because we are robed in the righteousness of God, having been justified by what he has done. Now we are holy and blameless before him. He doesn't see us as those wicked sinners anymore. He has given us a new life. We are born again, born by the Spirit. We are now a new creature in Christ. No, we're all things that become new. And secondly, he gives us a new home. As in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. We have been given a new home, for now heaven is my home. We have been given, we are now part of a new family. We are now adopted into the family of God. And we don't have to win any contests to get there. And finally, God gets the glory, not man. God gets the glory, the chief end of the chief aim. And as it's written here, to the praise of the glory of his grace. To wrap it up, as we heard earlier, Paul tells us we are in him, that we who are in him, in him, who are in Christ and saved, to be careful how we build, talking to the church. According to verse 12 there, he said in that chapter of 1 Corinthians 3, we can spend our time and talent on what is characterized as precious stones, proving a quality of spiritual life that will flowed from the right doctrine, which was built on the foundation. And as verse 12 says, uh, 
will be re will be rewarded. In contrast to building carefully as commanded, we can be careless in building upon the foundation. And it also says in verse 12, rather than be the precious stones as are when we're uh, building carefully, they're not the precious stones. Here this time, because we're not careful, but careless, producing wood, hay, or straw. Not the precious stones that survived the testing of fire, but ones whose work, all that they've done, all the duties they've done, all the behavior, everything, every good thing you one would think burns up. In other words, it's a worthless work, still saved. As he says there, yes, saved, but saved as if through fire, suffering loss, loss of rewards. Let it be a reality that we share the heartfelt gratitude, just as Paul demonstrated, treasuring the promises of these doctrinal riches, these spiritual blessings that God chose us, just as he told us, just as is written, the proof reflected in receiving a life in Christ a new home in heaven, and an adoption into the family of God. And let it be proven true that we are never caught tossing our riches into the path, you know, into the trash, in Jesus' name. Until the next time, I pray that the Lord bless you with spiritual blessings, you and your household, in Jesus' name. Amen.